Hello students, welcome to Legacy IS Academy. Today we have come up, come up with yet another interesting topic that has been in news from past few days regarding the new border law in, uh, promulgated by China. And we are going to discuss about the challenges that it presents with the India and the Indian diplomacy. So let us delve deeper into the topic. However, before going into deeper about the new law and its repercussions, let us try to understand a slight background about the border between India and China. So basically the border between India and China can be divided into three different sectors. The first we are going to discuss about is the western sector that is about 2150 kilometers long. That is a boundary line between the Ladakh region of India and the Tibet region of China. And here we have a area of dispute that is presently Aksai Chin region that was captured or occupied by China since the war of 1962. After this, the next border is can be characterized as a middle sector. This border is the smallest region or a smallest sector for extending up to a distance or length of 625 kilometers. And this is basically a dividing line again between Tibet part of China and the Uttarakhand and Himachal Pradesh state of India. This border is largely undisturbed and we do not have a lot of disputes regarding the demarcation of border line or boundary line between both the countries. So we can say this is a peaceful border. However, the third border that extends for a distance of almost 1140 kilometers in the eastern part of India, that is a border between Tibet region of China and Sikkim state of India as well as the whole Arunachal Pradesh state of India. This border we can say is largely a disputed border as China claims that whole Arunachal Pradesh as they are ethnically related to China, the people living in Arunachal Pradesh should or is belonging to China and India is an occupying state. While India maintained its position that Arunachal Pradesh from very beginning itself has been an integral part of the Indian territory. So this is regarding the border. Here the most important dispute that we see and also from last 16, 17 months, uh, 16, 17 months since uh, I think June 2, 2020, uh, 2020, there has been a standoff going on between both India and China and that is the first border region that is western sector as a place is the Aksai Chin. So Aksai Chin actually is an area that is considered geographically as the southwestward extension of Tibet plateau itself. And if you look at that from the China's perspective, then it is considered as the southernmost part of the Xinjiang province of China, which is a, a part of Uyghur autonomous region. Uyghur are the ethnic minority of China who follow Muslim or Islam religion and they live just above the uh, Aksai Chin regions. Apart from that, Aksai Chin has always been a very high elevated area, very high terrain, difficult terrain at the altitude of somewhere about 5180 meters. And that is why from very beginning, the very less people or we can say less uh, rulers have shown any interest in this Aksai Chin region. But for China, this region is very important as this is the only region through the Himalayas that provides them a direct access between the upper side that is the uh, lower side the Tibet and the upper side we have the uh, Tarim Basin. Then it is geographically as we discussed high isolated very inhospitable kind of terrain and that is why it is mostly uninhabited and inhabitable terrain, uh, terrain or plain and that is why for people or for people to settle down here it's not very uh, like uh, we can say not very good area but it has a strategic significance, significance for both the countries. You try to understand it geographically then to the south and southwest of this region we have Karakoram range and to the north and northeast of this Aksai Chin region we have the Kunlun mountain. So it is bound by two very high mountain ranges from both the sides. This red region that you can see on the map of India is the one that represents the Aksai Chin part of the territory. And if you look at the geographically or physically then here we can understand this region is the Aksai Chin region. On the upper side, this you can see, this is the Kunlun Shan mountain belonging to China. And the lower side, we have the Himalayas. And the north and northeastern side, we have the Karakoram range. Karakoram range is considered as the part of Trans Himalayas, just, that is just beyond the great Himalayan ranges of Himalayas, Himalayas mountains. And it is part of the four main ranges, the Karakoram range, Ladakh range, Jaska range, and Kailas range. These four ranges constitute what we call geographically as the Trans Himalayas. So this is the location of Aksai Chin to the south and southwest of Karakoram range and to the north and northeast we have the Kunlun mountains. And as we discussed before, it is the eastward extension of the Tibet plateau. Now let us try to understand the timeline of the dispute in the Aksai Chin region that has been going on 
between both the countries of India and China. So the first recorded history of boundary between Aksai, Chin and Tibet dates back to somewhere about 1680s where we see a treaty that was signed between the rulers of Ladakh and Tibet and this treaty clearly demarcates that Aksai Chin belongs to the Ladakh and as Ladakh is an integral part of China, uh, India, so that is why we can say that Aksai Chin has always been an integral part of India. And that is why this treaty actually debunks the China's claim that Ladakh is the integral part of Tibet. And that is why Aksai Chin should be the part of Tibet. The next important document that we have is somewhere from 1842, because in year 1834, there was a Dogra chief, Maharaja Gulab Singh, who was a suzerain state, or you can say was under the suzerainty of, this Dogra kingdom was a suzerainty of Sikh kingdom or Sikh empire in India. And in the war, it was him who had conquered the Ladakh in 1834. Following this defeat of the Ladakh kingdom, the treaty occurred between rulers of Tibet and rulers of Kashmir. And due to this, and in this treaty, it was, it was clearly demarcated or clearly identified that Ladakh has been an integral part of Kashmir. So that treaty or this treaty also debunks the claim of China and Ladakh being the territory of China. Further, four years later, as there was an Anglo-Sikh war where the Sikh kingdom, was, Sikh kingdom was defeated by the British rulers and that is when the Kashmir along with the Ladakh came directly under the British rule and then the British decided the boundary of Ladakh and Tibet since then, since 1846 until they left India uh, in the 1947. And the India has since then retained the border even post independence, the border that was demarcated by Britain between Tibet, between Ladakh and Kashmir, or we can say between Ladakh and Tibet has been inherited from them. Then apart from that, coming to next, in 1865, some other discoveries, some other important event has happened is that one person that is William Johnson. William Johnson actually was a member of Survey General of India and Institute of Survey General of India and he presented a line that is called as Johnson line to demarcate the boundary between Tibet and China, uh, Tibet and India. However, this line was not presented to the Chinese government because this was a time when a revolt that is known as Dungan revolt was going on in the Xinjiang part of China. And at that time, since the Dungan revolt was actually a revolt of, uh, we can say Muslim uh, or Islamic people against the main Han Chinese emperor. So during that revolt, as China did not have full control over Xinjiang, and Johnson line actually demarcates the boundary between Xinjiang, Tibet and India. So this was not presented to the Chinese. However, few years later, 30 years later, almost in 1899, another British, uh, we can say another British cartographer called as McCartney and MacDonald, they both presented a new line that is called as mccartney MacDonald line to the Chinese government where the border was slightly changed. However, there was no response from the Chinese government that was King, Qing dynasty uh, was ruling China at that time and did not give any response toward the mccartney MacDonald line. And that is why since then, if you look at the uh, this past maps or past documents, up till 1947, the Johnson line was considered by, by British as a boundary between India and Tibet, and not even by British, even if you look at up till 1947, the Peking University Atlas of China as well as Postal Atlas of China, both when they have, uh, we can say, published the map of India and China, have clearly shown Aksai Chin region belonging to the Indian territory, not to the Chinese territory. So from this, what we can understand that up till year 1947, there was a no problem between the border of India and China, at least in the Western sector, because even Chinese government believe or Chinese uh, publications believe that Aksai Chin to be the integral part of India. However, we see a significant shift as per the documents in the Chinese policies toward Ladakh and Aksai Chin somewhere between the years of 1952 to 1959. And let me remind you, this was the time also when the friendship between China and India was very much in news, was very much, we can say, uh, uh, promulgated by the Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, who was the Prime Minister of India at that time. And the slogan, very popular slogan of Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai was going on everywhere in the radios, in the televisions, in the publication newspapers. And it was this time that China actually betrayed India. And when this, all these things, the friendship was being uh, the China-India Prince of Hindi, Chini Bhai Bhai things were going on. China was busy in, in building a Sinkiang-Tibbat highway passing through the Aksai-Chin region of India. 
and it was believed to the highest highway at that time in the world that was going to be completed. So Ch Indian government did not have any idea that such kind of highway or construction is being going on because it is very difficult terrain and the accessibility to this region at least from the Indian side at that time was very much difficult but China has an EG access. However, later on the satellite images released by various agencies prove that indeed China is involved in building up a highway through the Aksai Chin territory of India. And on discovery of this information between 1959-1962, we can see a very significant flux or change in the dynamics of India-China friendship or India-China relationship where the myth of friendship earlier believed to be existing between both countries or both Asian superpowers was busted and this was also the building of this highway was also one of the most important flash points we can say that triggered the 1962 war between India and China and after 1962 war when it break out China as has they have much a stronger position militarily as compared to India they took advantage of them advantage of it they strengthened their position and after the war they entirely by themselves have set up the line of actual control unilaterally in Ladakh including the area that is currently in news that is called as Galwan Valley area where last year also we have very significant clashes or very uh, we can say violent clashes occurred between the army of both nations and if you look at the present day situation since 1962 war China has occupied almost 38,000 square kilometer or 14,000 square miles territory of India in this region of Aksai Chin where China can be said to be the aggressor state and LAC is currently the defining boundary around which or um, we can say opposite to which both the country have stationed their military or forces. So if we try to understand the same thing on the map what we have discussed till now. So as of now we can say there are three important lines. First we can say this is the black dotted line that is the map of India as per the Indian government and as per the Indian territory and this is in the line with the Johnson line that British shaped that defined or that used to define the boundary between India and China. So this is as per the claim by India. However, this we can see another line that is called as the that is the green line. This green line was something that we discussed is called as the McCartney McDonald line which was presented to the Chinese government at that time uh, for a new border but there was no response for the Chinese government. However, Recently there is uh, this, uh, this uh, fact is coming into news that Chinese government is still want that or believe that McCartan McDonald has is to be the genuine line that is dividing India and China but that that time did not have any kind of response. And third we can see in the map is this red line. This red line actually uh, is the line that is called as LAC or line of actual control and this line was demarcated after the 1962 war and this is the actual right now. The, uh, shows the actual positions of the troops of both the countries in this particular regions of Aksai Chin. So this is currently this is the actual boundary or present boundary. So three lines the black line, the green line and the red line and we can see this is very important geographical feature here is there that is called as Pangong So Lake. It is the second highest salt water lake in India. So about 80% of Pangong So currently lies in the Indian territory while 20% is occupied by China as it lies to the opposite side of the line of actual control. So now the most recent confrontation that has occurred in this area happened in year 2020 somewhere in the month of June there was classes that occurred between both the forces in the Galwan Valley region and this was first time that the battle or we can say the classes occurred with the sticks and clubs however guns were not used but this is also very important event because before then since 1975 till 2020 whatever classes or disputes that has occurred on the boundary between Indian and Chinese forces it was mostly a verbal exchange or just push and pull kind of exchanges but this was more violent in characteristic or more violent in nature as compared to the last classes so that is why it is significant. Similarly in the same year in August China or India accused China of provoking military tensions in the border twice within a single week however China has obviously denied the both charges and blamed the Indian government for the standoff. In the same year in September China accused India of firing shot at its troops while India at the same time accused China of firing shots in the air and if this claim comes out to be true it will be the first time in the last 45 years that a shots has been fired from any of the sites at the Indochina border. So this Galwan Valley region has a very important reason and if we try to understand this Galwan Valley region through the video we can see that what we can see from here is that Galwan Valley lies 
somewhere it is the highest border region on the earth and it lies somewhere on the line of actual control between Karakoram range and the Kunlun mountain ranges. Apart from that, there has also been other significant classes. The one is that Nathula class. Nathula class occurred in year 1967. Nathula, if we try to understand from the map, it is the example of a tri-junction path. Here we can see the location of Nathula. And at this tri-junction path, it is called as tri-junction path because it is lying between three different countries, Tibet, that is part of China, Sikkim, that is part of India, and the southward side we have Bhutan. So the classes occurred here also, and as per the report released by Indian government, around 80 Indian soldiers were martyred. At the same time, Chinese had suffered the casualty of 400 uh, personnel. Again, about seven years later in 1975, another class occurred in the same region of Tulungla, which is again lying in the Sikkim area. And it was a significant clash because it was the first time, or we can say the last time on the India-China border, when the shots were fired, official shots were reported. However, this claim is completely rejected by the China. Then in the year 2017, there was again a long month long high altitude standoff that has taken place in the Bhutan's Doklam region. Now if you see, look at this area. So this is the Doklam region and this Doklam region again lies between Sikkim on the east, Bhutan in the west and south and China in the north. This again is a very important territory or very important vantage point for India's and China's both perspective and that is because it has a strategically significant. The reason is because Doklam Plateau and through the Chumbi Valley which is near it, it provides a passageway to a something that is termed as Chicken's Neck. The region just south of Doklam in India is called as Chicken's Neck or the other term used for this is Siliguri Corridor. Siliguri Corridor. So this area is significant from this point of view because Chicken Snake is a very narrow region, almost 60 to 70 kilometer width or having 60 to 70 kilometer width that connects the whole mainland India with the northeastern India. And if Chinese in terms of war or in times of war are able to take control of this Chicken Snake region, then you can understand that India will have a difficulty as the whole northeastern region or the seven states of northeastern region will be totally cut off from the India as they do not have any land access apart from this Chicken Snake or Siliguri Corridor. So that is why Doklam Plateau has a very important or strategically significant because if the Chinese are start or able to build up military there, they can easily access this Chicken Snake area of India. Then let us try to understand from this background that how these new laws or what are the new laws promulgated by the China and how this can help India, or sorry, it can uh, present challenges to the India. So the law, first of all, it has been passed by the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress, who is believed or which is believed to be the highest legislative body of the China. And it has three important, we can say, component in the law. First, law aims for protection and exploitation of the country's land border areas. Second, it aims to, in, uh, it aims for the sovereignty or it claims that the sovereignty and territorial integrity of China are sacred and inviolable. And third, it aims to strengthen border defense and also support economic and social development as well as opening of border areas, not only for military movement, but also for, uh, we can say, build up of civil, civilian population or to build up the civilian houses and villages or something like this. So let us try to understand through these lenses that how or how these laws can affect India. Apart from that, one other thing is that the law also mentions that in case of dispute that is between India, China and other members, the resolution of such dispute and long standing border issue should always follow the principles of equality, mutual trust and friendly consultation. So this is a kind of a good approach that Chinese law portrays to us. However, the takeaways for India, what, we should, what should be our takeaways or understanding for India from these laws, let us try to understand this. So first term that has been used in this new law is that China's border is sacred and inviolable. So what experts, at especially the military experts or strategists believe that this means that the already the promulgation of this law or the bringing up of this law and use of such terms that the China's border is sacred and inviolable at the same time when there is already a prolonged discussion going on to resolve the standoff in the Ladakh region, especially in the Aksai Chichen region and the Galwan Valley of um, this Aksai Chichen region, it portrays or it tells us that Beijing has this mentality or Beijing is likely to dig in its heel at the current position. That means they are not in the mood to change the status quo they want the present position or actual ground position line to be the demarcating line and that is the main takeaway from this particular thing. 
Second is that as per the new law, the responsibilities for the management of the China border has been completely relegated or delegated to the PLA that is the People's Liberation Army. So some experts believe that this is clear opposite to what we have situation in India as in India we have a lack of clarity or who is the actual manager of the border, who is the main entity responsible for the border management in India because both the Ministry of Home Affairs as well as the Ministry of Defense are involved from time to time in the border management. The reason is because if you look at the border management then border security forces, indo tibetan border police as well as uh, Assam rifles are engaged in border management during peaceful times or when there is not such a war like situations which is clearly an uh, example of or uh, part of central armed police forces and that are governed by the Ministry of Home Affairs. However, at the time of war or when there is a very significant disturbance at the border, the generally the militaries are called, the border, uh, this we can say the Indian military is called, Indian armed forces are called, which are or who are under the jurisdiction of Ministry of Defense. So there is a kind of overlapping jurisdiction in case of border management, which is different from the China. Third is uh, China's Chinese law aims for protection and exploitation of the country's land border areas. So that is just stating the obvious as per the last Indian ambassador to China, Gautam Bambavale, because it's the business of all the countries for protection and exploitation of countries land border areas. However, what key takeaways we can get from this particular theme is that Mr. Bambavale believes that the Chinese through this term indicating that in case they are not able to settle the border dispute by peaceful consultations or peaceful negotiations, they are even able or they are even willing to use or settle the disputes through the use of military forces. Apart from this, one more important uh, development that is going on through the Chinese side of the border is there is development of model villages by the China and especially the will of border defense villages across the line of actual control in all the sectors, the western sector as well as the eastern sector is being observed and the military, retired military generals and military experts believe that this villages in the time of adversity can be used for both civil uses as well as military purposes. And this kind of development changes the facts on the ground or China is trying to change the facts on the ground, not only through the military but also through the civilian presence. If we try to understand this in more detail, what it tells is that the model villages, if Chinese are able to settle their population on the other side of line of actual control and suppose in case of consultation negotiation, as India claims a large area that is lying to the vast stretch op opposite to the line of actual control, the Chinese will have an upper hand because they can in the negotiation bring up this fact that they have already settled the civilian population in between that areas and that is why they cannot move the civilian population on villages and that is why the current border should be the border India has to accept. So in this case, China will Chinese will have upper hand because of the development of model villages in case of future negotiation and consultation. So this should be the major takeaways. Now we know that the dispute on the India-China border has been going on for a very significant or a very long period of time and at least like 60-70 years has passed but there has been some on the positive note some dispute resolution mechanism has been developed by both the countries. So if you look at some important mechanisms there, first is the spatial representative mechanism on the boundary questions that was established in year 2003 that has been continuously working and still functional till now. Second was in 2010, another working mechanism was set up between both countries for consultation and cooperation in the border areas and the most important event or uh, this significant development that has occurred in year 2013 between both countries is the signing of border defense cooperation agreement where both the countries have uh, discussed or come together and have established that the border issues related issues and the issues related to the social, economic and military presence should be dealt with in accordance with peaceful negotiation and should be not, the, the classes should not become violent in nature. However, this has been, uh, after even 2013, there has been severe significant classes. So the agreement has not been followed in entirety or in later and split by the Chinese forces. So that questions the intent of China. However, these are three currently working mechanisms to solve or settle the boundary dispute between both the nations. And the com question comes that what should be the principles of disengagement that should follow the relation between both countries. So this was something that has been suggested by current foreign minister who is also the expert on China, Dr. S. Jay Sankar. So he has given us three important points that one has to keep in mind. First is the agreements 
that is signed between both nation must be adhered to their entirety in the later end spread. As you saw before, the border cooperation agreement that was signed did not talk about having violent classes, but still we have violent uh, classes from the Chinese side. So this is something that both countries have to work on, especially China. Second is the strict observation and respect of the line of actual control and any attempt to unilaterally change the status quo is completely unacceptable. This is also uh, has been difficult uh, to carry out because China has in past several times tried to cross the LSE, have tried to pitch their tent on the Indian side of line of actual control and has tried to provoke the Indian army or Indian military in taking some action against that. Third is the peace and tranquility in border areas has always been or was the basis for development of relationship in other domains and that is why this is something that both countries have to work on for maintenance of this unless the issue is resolved permanently. But that is also a problem because if there is no peace, at, uh, peace or tranquility at the border issue, the, our relationship has in actually acquired a great depth we can say. Since independence, the relationship between India and China have acquired great depth, especially in the economic terms. China and India both are significant economic partners in terms of trade relationship, in terms of investment, in terms of, uh, in terms of business. And not only that, but also cultural relationship has developed between both the countries, people to people relationship has developed between both the countries. So all these relationships can be adversely affected and can suffer intensely, uh, immensely if a peace and tranquility does not prevail at the border. Because China and India border issue is very uh, uh, kind of, you can say, uh, issue that is picked up by media in both the countries has very emo important emotional, uh, we can say, em emotive role to play in the psyche of the population of both the countries. And so any such event can trigger, uh, like we can see, the boycott of Chinese goods started to take place. And that would cause suffer, uh, suffering not only to the Indian side, but also to the Chinese side. So that is where something countries have to work upon. So finally, we say that what should be the way forward for cooperation between both countries. So we need to understand that since the time immemorial, there has been an element of cooperation as well as competition with both countries. As both countries got independence almost at the same time in the end, somewhere in 1950s. And that is why both countries emerged as a competitor to increase their sphere or domain in the Asia. And that is why there has been cooperation and competition. And of course, there has been divergences when it ever comes to the interests and aspirations of both the countries. Because China, they have very strong relationship, close relations with Pakistan. And traditionally, India and Pakistan always have very strong, bad, bitter relationship. And that is also one reason where the interest of both nations diverges. Also, India has bought a dispute with both Pakistan and China. And some area of Pakistan, disputed area was ceded to the China uh, by the Pakistan. So all this kind of development created a bitter relationship between India and China. And that is where our interest diverge. However, both the countries have taken a mature role, we can say have taken a mature uh, ground, a stand, and have painstakingly worked together to normalize the relationship, especially after the event of 1962 war and the first prime ministerial visit that occurred in year 1982. And the outcome of this we can see that both the countries have developed a complete and practical set of understandings and agreements that focuses on border management. The three major bilateral solving mechanism, a border uh, dispute mechanism we have seen are the examples of such particular outcome. And that is why taking into account the future of the relationship between both countries is it important to understand that the both countries have a common goal of building a multipolar world. That is not a bipolar or unipolar world, but a multipolar world. But multipolar world concept cannot be, uh, we can see, seen in the real or practical life if a multipolar Asia is not, uh, a multipolar Asia does not develop. So that is why for development of multipolar Asia, it is very important that both countries, India and China, come together on a platform, they resolve their differences and work together to achieve the common goal of multipolar world. And as both countries are growing exponentially in economic terms, in military terms, and they are becoming very important players on the global geopolitics as a rising power, both of them or neither of them should ignore the other sets of aspiration. It is very important that both countries understand the aspirations of each other and try to support and try to adjust or we can say compromise wherever such situations of conflict occur. And that is why it is very important that rather than being parochial in outlook, being very narrow mindedness to solve the border dispute or to uh, capture on each other's ter capture, uh, territory, both countries should always take a long view approach and work together to build a harmonious world. So 
that's all for uh, today i hope you like the video if you like it kindly like subscribe and share to your friends we'll come soon with another important and interesting topic and details about that till then take care thank you very much